but what they have to do is to put it in the closest equivalence in ordinary language that they can to express this. Because in one way they say that this experience doesn't even take place in time and space as you and I are now appreciating temporal or spatial consciousness. But in some non-spatial and non-temporal um, aspect of living. But what they try to tell us is that they become aware of a passageway. And they go through this passageway, often described as a dark tunnel, and they come out on the other side, they say, into an incredibly brilliant and warm and loving light. And I hear people describing them this all the time, that they say, you just feel permeated at this point with love. And as you enter into this light, you sort of dissolve into it. And feelings of complete peace and love, comfort, and joy. And in this situation, they say, that relatives or friends of theirs who have already passed away seem to be there to meet them and to greet them and to help them through this transition. Incidentally, another interesting detail I found again in different parts of the world about this is that people say that, for example, if in this situation your grandfather had been elderly when he died and was showing the signs of age, that the person you meet in that light is vibrantly alive and as though rejuvenated and, and at the prime of life. Um, that time and aging doesn't really seem to be a factor in this situation. And incidentally, it's interesting that that same observation is made in Oriental countries where there's a great deal of respect for being elderly and so on. That even in that context, that the people that they meet and that light are rejuvenated and vibrantly alive. And in the course of this experience, they will tell us that often that out of this field of light that they are in, often I hear that there is an area of this light that begins to get even more intense, and it grows in an intensity. Throughout this, they say this is far brighter than anything that we have ever experienced while we're alive, and yet still not uncomfortable to the eyes, that it's not an uncomfortable experience. But that as this light grows brighter, then everything else sort of disappears. And they say that they are surrounded by a panorama, a holographic panorama, that's my own words, but that everything that they have ever done, they say, is displayed around them instantaneously in this panorama. They say that obviously when you talk about this, you have to describe it as a sequence, but it doesn't take place sequentially. Everything is there at once in an instant. And yet, even when I grilled them and impressed them after getting these accounts, and I said, you mean literally everything. Again and again, I hear, uh, yes, everything, including, as one man said, my own birth uh, staring section. And everything they say is portrayed there. And when you see it, you don't see it in the way that you saw it when you were going through each experience in your life. Rather, they say, you're watching yourself as though you're another person. And you watch yourself doing an action. And when that action has its consequence, you, you feel that you are empathetically identified at that point with the person with whom you have interacted. Hence, if you see yourself doing a loving action to one of your fellow human beings, then when that action has its results, you can have the good feelings that you brought about in that person's life. Or if you see yourself doing an unloving action to someone else, then you see the sadness you brought about in that person's life. And I often wonder as a psychiatrist, well, what about those people that no matter what good you do before them, I don't want to like that. Five hours making you this cake, oh, that's the worst cake ever. You know, that you just can't believe. And I, 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 it's interesting that um, George Ritchie, a good friend of mine, who's the first person I ever knew who had an experience like this, said that really what shows through in this panorama is your intention, or what was in your heart at, at that point. Um, I have a friend named Euron Greep, who's a 
professor of anesthesiology in Sweden, and Euron has studied these experiences uh, among Swedish patients and got interested in it because he himself, as a child, had a near-death experience which greatly impacted him for the rest of his life. And um, Euron, being very articulate, described this to me in an interesting way. He said that if, if you imagine that this panorama of the events of your life is a plain surface, a flat surface in front of you, and that each particular action in your life is represented on that surface by a particular point. He said that within that context, you have, your, you have a, a choice of looking at each one of those actions from either one of two distinct ways. And I'm going to have to use his gestures to reproduce this. He said that if this is the action you're looking at, he said you can look at it this way, and you see trailing off from behind it in that direction all of the events and circumstances in your life that led up to that action and decision. But, he says, simply by an effort of will or concentration, you switch your attention. And then you see trailing off from it in that direction all of the consequences that that action had on you and also on other people which makes you think immediately that this is something that at least I wouldn't want to go through. I mean, this is not I'm not looking forward to as I think about this. And, um, and I think probably everybody is in that situation. We've all done things that we wish we had. And yet the people I've talked with who go through this say invariably that this was a learning experience, that even though there were painful things that everybody sees there, that this experience as a whole had a very profound impact on their lives. To the point where at some point in this experience, obviously, they have to come back. And at that point, people, people have variable accounts about how they get back. Once in a while, you have people who tell us that they don't know how they got back, that suddenly they were in this light, and then they felt themselves back there on the operating room table with the doctor pounding their chest or whatever. Other uh, people will tell us that at some point they were given a choice, that they were told that they could either stay in this experience that they were going through at the time where they had their, their opportunity to go back to the life they had been leading, and perhaps not surprisingly, all the ones that I've talked with in that situation. <laughs> and what I find interesting about that is that almost invariably, uh, they say the same thing about why they came back. And that is that they will say that, for me, I would rather have stayed. But they say they chose to go back, typically because they had, had young children left to raise. And the two exceptions that come immediately to my mind of thousands, there may be more in, in this category, but the two I most remember are two young women who were in the helping professions. One was a social worker and the other was a nurse and they both recently had finished their training. And both of them said that given that opportunity, they chose to come back because, as, as they said, they had committed themselves to this helping profession and reached that point in their training and said so they wanted to go back specifically to help people. Other people, incidentally, are, say at this point that they're just told you have to go back. It's not your choice. You've got things left to do. And when they do get back, this is where it gets really interesting from the point of view of a psychiatrist who spent a number of years in, in dealing with um, people with neurotic difficulties and so on, and also from my own life experience, knowing how hard it is to get rid of a neurosis. I mean, as painful as it makes you feel, neurosis is a Familiar, familiar thing, so you hold on to it and you torture yourself with the same old patterns again and again. And, and I know how difficult it has been in my life for, to deal with neurosis, and I see that in patients as well. And so what is really startling to me about this is these dramatic life changes that you see in people who go through this. Um, and, and they um, tend to take a pattern um, about the most common thing they tell us is that whatever their life aim or uh, attitude had been up to this point, whether they were seeking fame or power or any of these other things, 
that what really they have to face up to at this point is the question of love. And they say that after coming back from this, that their primary aim in life is to learn how to love and to cultivate loving relationships. And I immediately want to go on to say that I've never talked with anybody that I've known well who that I'm sure has had one of these experiences who has conveyed any other attitude to me than that it is still very difficult to do that. And uh, the words that come back to me again are Dr. George Ritchie, a psychiatry professor at, at the University of Virginia, who I first heard about this from in 1965. And about 11 years later, in 1976, George said these words to me, Raymond, this experience makes your humanity even more of a burden in a way. And what he meant by that was that even after you have an experience like this, it's tough putting that kind of ideal into practice on a on a day-to-day -day, um, level. Another thing that you hear from these people is that they say that I, they, after this they don't have any more fear of death. Because to them personally, this is an assurance of a transition that what we call death is a transition into someplace else. And I uh, say, well, is that just a macho attitude that just lasts a shortly after this experience. No, as you can imagine, after I've been doing this 30 years now, I've known quite a number of people who I originally met because they had this experience, and then I've been able to follow them in their life course, and I've seen as um, the number of them have developed terminal illnesses and have actually gone on and died. And I can say absolutely that this is quite inspiring, that the, um, the way that people really live this. Let me give you one thing. I had a good friend named Vi who died about a year and a half ago. And Vi had like multiple operations on her spine and her neck. And uh, I've known so many patients that I've known over the years who have had uh, this kind of surgery. I know from that kind of experience that this is a very painful thing and people commonly in that situation are constantly complaining about the pain. Well, about 10 years ago I was visiting Vine and uh, she mentioned to me that she had been to Atlanta in the previous years and I said, well, why did you go to Atlanta, Vine? And she said, well, I went to Six Flags, which is the amusement park. And I said, why did you go to Six Flags? And she said, well, I just love to ride the roller coaster. And this was a woman who, I can't imagine how, uh, but nonetheless, she, even with these back braces and so on, spinning around in the roller coaster. And indeed, they do reach this point where death is not a fearful process for them. And I've seen this happen. Even to the end, they can rally the sort of resources and bring people together. Another thing you see from these people that's very impressive is that a quest for knowledge talked with quite a number of people over the years who their response to their near-death experience was to go out and to take a college course. Just a couple of years back, talked to an airline pilot who had his near-death experience, and then right after that went back to college and continued his education and graduated. Talked in Toronto with a man who was already in his 70s, late in his 70s, who had just recently uh, received his PhD degree. And what had happened was he said when he was already in his 70s, he had a near-death experience and this so inspired him with curiosity about the world that he went back and actually finished the PhD. Um, what people say in this incidentally is that they go through this review, they often say that they experience in them, experience in them the presence of a very loving presence who sort of guides them and directs their attention to certain parts of it. And they say that when, as this review proceeds, when events in which they have been learning or pursuing a course of knowledge come up, that this being is very, very interested in that and sort of focuses in on it and imparts to them in a offhand sort of way that, oh, that's very interesting that even when you die, the learning process goes on. 